Hello, I'm Sangeeta Candola. Welcome to Finance, Equity and Inclusion, a programme by ITN Business. We continue to live in an economically uncertain landscape. But through innovation, technology and putting people first, there are ways to create a more equitable and inclusive financial future. To discuss this further, I'm joined now by FinTech Circle CEO, Suzanne Chisty. Suzanne, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Why is equity and inclusion so important in finance? In finance, equity and inclusion are a strategic necessity because diverse perspectives foster innovation and enhance decision-making and risk management. And so what does equity actually mean? So equity means to treat everybody fairly. Equity is not the same as equality. There's a small, subtle difference. So equality means everybody is treated equally while equity means and equity acknowledges that not everybody starts from the same starting point. So the individual circumstances are different and therefore the treatment might be different or might have to be different in order to achieve that the end goal is equal. And secondly, inclusion. Inclusion refers to the fact that we want to give individuals, irrespective of their background, access to financial opportunities, to increase economic opportunities, to increase our financial environment overall. And therefore, diversity, equity and inclusion have got the power to dismantle systemic barriers which still exist and to cultivate an industry and a society which really caters for all. And as CEO and founder of FinTech Circle, that's very important to me. That's why I am a champion of DEI uh, since a long time. And in terms of gender diversity, for example, we know, we know that 50% of all customers in finance are women. And therefore, I believe, you know, that 50% of all leadership positions of wealth should be held by women too. How can the financial sector provide a fairer financial future through innovation, technology or sustainability? Innovation, technology and sustainability are the cornerstones of fairer finance. The reason why those three pillars are so important is because innovation always challenges the status quo. It allows us to come up with new business model, new ideas, new solutions to cater for new market segments. Technologies such as AI, for example, new data analytics, allows to democratize access to financial services, so to allow to service new customer segments at lower costs, which has not been possible in the past. And equally, sustainability is key because it allows for ethical growth, sustainable growth. And that's what we want to get to, you know, in our sector. So Suzanne, how can the financial sector best implement net zero plans? The Standard & Poor's 500 Net Zero ESG Index has outperformed the S&P 500 Generic Index this year. So we can see that reducing carbon intensity increases operational efficiency and the share price, which is great news. So collaboration with industry peers regulators and other stakeholders helps us to accelerate our transition to net zero. And that's important because we are desperately in need to move to, net, to a net zero economy over the next 25 years to ensure that our temperatures do not rise by more than 1.5 degrees. And Suzanne, globally, how does the fintech circle community focus on fairer finance. We want to make sure that fintech is a force for good. We want to make sure that fintech empowers individuals, companies, SMEs to contribute to a better society, to allow all of us to answer the question, why do we exist? And why do we as companies make the world a better place? Suzanne, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
The UK is home to many of the world's largest fintech companies, and it's a growing sector. 98% of fintechs are contributing to the UK's economy and growth, from jobs creation to service provision. I met with Innovate Finance's CEO, Janine Hurt, to find out more about how the UK should keep up the momentum. Fintech is a growing sector in the UK, but there is competition internationally. Tell me what areas specifically. So the UK is a global leader in financial technology. Last year we received more than 12.5 billion US dollars of investment. We are second only to the United States and we're ahead of all of the rest of Europe combined. So we have an incredible international leadership position. But it's incredibly important that we also don't lose momentum. And that's going to mean we have to have industry working together with government, working together with regulators to make sure that we are embracing this new technology and benefiting the end consumers well. As the fintech sector grows, do you think there's a greater need for regulation? So there are a number of different pieces of legislation and regulation that cover the entirety of the fintech landscape. But there are some really exciting technologies that are coming up where we need to ensure that we're protecting the consumer, but also enabling them to benefit from these new areas. And that means we have to see that collaboration across industry, government and regulators as well. In terms of how, you know, Innovate Finance plays into that, how, how does that work? So we are essentially the industry body for UK fintech. We're the voice of UK fintech. And so underlying all of the work that we do is advocacy and lobbying work to ensure that the UK is the best place in the world to start a fintech company, to grow a fintech company, and to build a fintech company. And such an important piece of that is ensuring that we have the right regulatory framework and the right environment here for fintechs to scale. The future is increasingly digital. So does that mean that the fintech sector is well positioned to benefit from the digital tools available? I think the fintech sector is actually already ahead of the game because they have been using some of this digital technology, these new tools already to bring new products out to the customer bases. So we're in a great position in a, as an ecosystem, as a sector. We do tend to be very agile, we're able to pivot very quickly, but the most important thing is we put customers first and we put the customers, whether those are individuals or SMEs, at the center of the proposition. So this new technology will have an enhancing benefit to the ecosystem as well. So I think fintechs are able to adopt new technology on a much quicker basis simply by the nature of their organization. Many of the large incumbent financial institutions may have legacy processes in place that make it more difficult to adopt some of this technology. Where we also see a lot of opportunity is, however, partnerships. So increasingly we're seeing what we call a marketplace effect, where fintechs and fintechs are working together to provide an array of solutions for the consumer. We're also seeing a great opportunity between fintech and large institutions institution collaboration as well. So the bigger banks, the high street banks, looking to see those core partners in the fintech ecosystem that can help them better cater to their own customers. We live in economically uncertain times, so is the fintech sector better placed than traditional financial services to support people through it? It's a great question. So we put out a report um, from Innovate Finance and EY earlier in this year in February that was focusing on the role of fintech in the cost of living crisis. And it actually mapped the areas where fintech is making a real and a tangible difference for consumers. So looking at things like new products to help individuals manage their money, better understand their money, grow their money, grow their savings, but also looking at tools that have been developed to support SMEs through this economic difficult period as well. Uh, there are also a number of different tools that have been created by fintechs that help with identifying potential victims of financial fraud before the fraud happens and also those vulnerable customers providing extra support to help them through this difficult period as well. Fintech as a force for good is something that's discussed quite a lot. What does it mean to innovate finance? So many people tend to point to the financial crash of 2007 and 2008 really as the birth of the fintech movement, so to speak. And it was at that point where new entrants came in, they rebuilt trust and resilience back in the financial services sector. And since that point in time, we've only seen fintechs continue to create a more inclusive, a more democratic, and really a more effective financial services sector that works better for everyone. We know that today, eight out of every 10 individuals in the UK are at least using one fintech tool on a regular basis. We also know that more than 50% of all SME lending in the UK is being done by fintechs. 
We released a report in collaboration with Accenture that is looking to quantify the impact of financial technology. And we found that 98% of the fintech ecosystem here in the UK is having a positive impact on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And more than a quarter of our community is directly addressing the issue of inequality through offering greater access to more products. So we're seeing a huge positive impact that this community of fintech uh, and financial innovators is providing. Investing in prime property has traditionally been the preserve of these super rich and multi-million pound companies, while property developers have often struggled to find funding options. However, Capital Rise's fintech platform is disrupting the old ways of financing luxury property developments to the benefit of both borrowers and those looking to invest in high-end real estate. The prime property market in southeast England is on the up, but investment opportunities have traditionally been limited to high net worth individuals. However, this model is changing, spearheaded by Capital Rise, who are lending money to property developers, but funded by a much wider range of investors. The reason why we founded the company was because we felt that there were sort of two very distinct markets that had um, unmet needs that we thought we could help with. So borrowers, so property developers that are focusing on developing property and the sorts of postcodes that we focus in on um, are very badly served by traditional lenders. Um, we could see that there was a gap in the market to help them uh, to provide um, finance that was fast, that was flexible, was given to them by somebody that really understands what they do on a daily basis. And then on the other side, typically the only types of people that had access to these sorts of investment opportunities were massive institutions or individuals with millions to invest. So by developing the fintech platform that we've built, we are now able to, order, uh, to, to enable a broader range of investors to have access to these sorts of opportunities. Capital Rise focuses their attention on prime residential real estate in London and the home counties, a resilient part of the housing market. The reason why we focus on this part of the market is because it is incredibly unique in that it has very different dynamics to the rest of the property market. The prime central London market has its own property cycle, which is completely distinct from the London market overall and completely distinct from the overall UK market. By developing a bespoke fintech platform, a broader range of investors now have access to more opportunities. This is a critical aspect of the process as are the additional advantages to the borrowers. What we do is we analyse and source opportunities on a daily basis that fit our lending criteria and um, cherry pick the best ones to lend. As a lender, what makes you different? We've so far lent over 300 million worth um, of loans. We've repaid over 143 million to our investors and that's a testament as a result of the level of expertise that we have. In an ever-changing fintech world, there's no doubt about the role of innovation led by a robust senior management team, a benefit to both investors and borrowers. The senior management team of Capital Rise, um, it, overall we have altogether about 100 years worth of expertise in the real estate industry. It's quite a diverse team. Some of us have a wider property experience and there are a few who have banking experience, so I think we all complement each other. Co-founders sit on our credit committee. We have, um, we have access to, to all this expertise that they have given their own experiences in developing and financing property. Capital Rise has not only opened up a unique asset class for individual investors, but its innovative approach is also proving to be popular. Prime real estate is a, an asset class which really, up until Capital Rise, was not available. And the returns are you know, very good on a risk-adjusted basis. With Capital Rise, it is possible to invest from £1,000, which changes the whole nature of investment in this area. And its humanistic approach with customer relationships at its core is also driving change. I got to know the underwriting team, which is brilliant. Likewise with the marketing team, who I've got to know over the years. And also with the customer support team. If there's ever an issue, you can either email, you can call, um, or you can use the, the web chat function. 
So as a team, as a collective team, it's just a pleasure to deal with them. They are really professional. You need to collaborate closely with your clients. And I think that's why once somebody's borrowed from a, a particular firm, if they've had a great service, they'll go back again and again. We are very flexible. We do make fast decisions. There's not a lot of bureaucracy. We're relatively small, 30 people based out of offices in Mayfair. You know, all of the decision makers meet on a regular basis. So we can make very quick decisions when we need to. And that offers us, I think, a superior service then that we can offer to to our borrowers um, and you know they come back over and over again so hopefully we're doing something right. The subscription economy is thriving as consumers seek more convenient and cost-effective ways to pay for products and services. Credit Spring is a membership loan service that offers no interest, short-term loans for a fixed monthly fee. I'm now joined by CEO Neil Karakator. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, how does applying a subscription business model to loans benefit customers? Well, it's all about making things eat safer and simpler. So we all know financial products these days are full of confusing terms, jargon, tricky fees. And we think, why can't loans be like products everyone else uses? You, you pay for coffee with subscriptions, gym with subscription, uh, music with subscription, why not loans? So we decided to do that. And specifically for loans, when you offer them through a subscription, you do a number of good things for the consumer. So number one, you make it very easy to understand exactly how much it's going to cost you, no tricky interest rates. And number two, even more importantly, without an interest rate attached, there's no risk of a debt spiral. You'll never pay more than what you thought you were going to pay when you bought the product. The short-term and payday loan market has got a bad reputation. Why do you think that is? And what is the right way to approach these types of loans? Well, short-term lending, payday loans, and also, I would say, overdraft have a bad reputation because they're fairly predatory and very risky ways to borrow. When you borrow at very high interest rates, one small mistake turns a small problem into a big problem. But here's the thing. Short-term loans need to exist in this country. 40% of the population has less than 100 pounds of savings. They need access to short-term credit. But as of today, you cannot get a loan in this country under 1,000 pounds or under a year without going to a payday loan or an overdraft. And, and we think this is wrong. This is why we started Credit Spring, to solve this need. We remove the interest rate and charge just a simple fixed monthly fee. And in addition to lending money, how else can you help members? A loan is one feature of the membership. We offer our members financial education, personalized to them. We help people build their credit just by paying their membership fees. We even offer a benefits finder where on average our members have found 860 pounds of benefits for free. We give all of this because it's about the whole solution. It's not just about giving a loan. It's about empowering people. So Neil, do you think there needs to be more education around finance? Absolutely. Most people don't understand financial products, particularly loans. And this is something we do not think is fair. It's possible to simplify it. And this is why we've gone to the subscription model. And we think more lenders should enter this space because it is possible. And there's huge demand. At Credit Spring, we've more than doubled in the last 12 months. We, we, we keep growing. We're processing millions of applications a month because people really need support through this time. What do you think the future holds? The future is very uncertain, but what we'd like to see is making financial products less transactional and more about sort of a whole 360 degree view on the customer. So it's not just here's the loan and forget about it. It's here's a loan that's appropriate for you. And now I'm going to surround you with other services, high quality customer support, education, be there to help you when you need it. And we think more, more and more lenders will start doing this as it becomes more important to really take care of the customer. Okay, Neil Gattacator, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving money across borders can be a slow and costly process for SMEs. Free Market's platform offers businesses an accessible solution. Its integrated ecosystem and customer-centric approach provides access to seamless currency exchange and transparent international payments.
For the past few years, SMEs have seen huge changes within the world of banking and payments. Getting control over their finances hasn't been easy or particularly clear. Free Market has listened to those who have felt underserved and provided a simple one-stop shop platform for cross-border payments, FX rates, international trade and more. We're very much on a mission to build the most comprehensive cross-border payments network and ensure that we can give SMEs a real-time platform through which they can manage their global liquidity and ensure that they can access a, an entire pool of tier one banks as opposed to going through the headache and the pains of onboarded, onboarding very fragmented and disparate providers. They can lean on us to do the heavy lifting in the knowledge that we've already integrated with those partners and ensure that should any bank fail in the near future that they're not going to be at risk of going out of business or dramatically having to find new partners. From a startup perspective, I think being agile and um, disruptive at our core gives us the flexibility to service a number of different markets who ultimately have very similar types of challenges. Developing new solutions on the platform relies on technology, knowledge and expertise and listening to the customer. We essentially go out and get all the banking relationships um, all the products that they offer and integrate them into one platform. So that then allows our clients that rather than them having multiple bank accounts, multiple different, set up with multiple different people, they can just be with us and have access to all of that. So we're always getting feedback from them on things that they want or things that would be slightly easier if it's done this way or markets they want to go into. And then because we built this all in house, we can then make those changes a lot quicker than a lot of our competitors who have outsourced their platform to another company. Our client can use our API and they can integrate directly with our API and do pretty much everything on there, or they have the option of our platform. So our platform is very straightforward and easy to use. Um, you pretty much can do everything in a couple of clicks. You're not having to go to multiple screens, multiple different parts. You very much can, you can make an international payment, literally, two or three clicks and you're done. The platform not only allows customers the ability to do what they need simply and quickly, but they can also offer feedback and speak to someone who really understands their needs. Very unique in our industry, to be fair. I mean, when you look at banking and finance, everyone's just looking at margins, profit, um, a name on a spreadsheet. Um, at the end of the day, we're just a, a commodity to be transacted. Um, so coming from a place and, and working with great people at Free Market that get it, it actually genuinely feels like you're working with partners and friends to achieve similar goals rather than felt like you're being transacted or not doing the subsequent levels of volumes or currency that then put a strain on the relationship. The customer is key at Free Market, delivering and tailoring a service that is beneficial to the client's company. Start building a good relationship. A very personalised service, so we've got quite a broad spectrum of clients across different verticals uh, based all around the world. So the service is yeah, very bespoke uh, depending on their individual needs. It's understanding what drives them, what requirements they've got, you know, what their industry needs uh, to make sure that what we offer is a good fit for them. We flew over to Sydney to sit down with a client to look at a particular issue they were having. And one of the things that came out of that meeting was their own banking provider was based a couple of streets away and they'd never met them. Service levels are really what sets us apart. It's not a, a one size solution. It's that sort of bespoke approach rather than just a, this is the product, now go away and use it. You know, we, we really work with them, we're on that journey with them. Manually managing products and services can become a complex task in the financial sector due to being so heavily regulated. Core Labs is using technology to support financial institutions, ensuring products are constantly monitored, freeing up employees' time and delivering better outcomes for customers. Nearly all of us use financial products and services of one description or another, and whether they're bank accounts, credit cards, mortgages or investments, we expect them to be managed efficiently on our behalf. 
But too often, traditional financial institutions rely on processes that are manual, outdated, cumbersome and complex. Sabrina Del Prete is on a mission to change this. She's worked for some of the biggest banks in the world for more than 25 years and set up core labs to find ways to digitize financial product management and to work within organizations to improve the way they do business. If you go right in the guts of an organization, right at the center of the product engine, where decisions are made that have an impact on so many businesses and people, then you can really move the dial. And that's our mission. We want to go there. We can because we know the territory, because we know what to do or not to do. And we want to be subtle. Because if you're subtle, then the DNA of an organization will not work against you, will work with you, and then you make a change. This is the workspace where you can navigate to the products that you're working on at any point in time. Josh Blundell is the Client Managing Director at Core Labs, and he showed me the set of digital tools they offer for creating, managing and monitoring financial products. Core Labs helps the financial services industry in three important ways. We ensure that they deliver products with demonstrable benefits. We help them monitor those products to ensure that they're delivering the right outcomes uh, and also delivering value for money. And we ensure that over time that those products stay up to date with evolving market trends to ensure that they're always delivering the right outcomes for their customers. I think technology is such an empowering tool. Yes. Hargreaves Lansdowne is the UK's number one investment platform for private investors and can see the benefits partnering with Core Labs could bring its 1.8 million clients. Core Labs and their technology will allow us to get feedback from clients very quickly. We can in integrate that into our product management process and we can be agile and nimble in how we change, deliver, design and progress our products and services. Core Labs will help us ensure that our help desk agents, our advisors and our websites presents the same information to clients at the same time. That means it's easier for our clients to make good and informed decisions. It's easier for us to ensure that they are achieving their outcomes that they need. And it's easy for us to manage the whole practice and the whole process. And delivering better outcomes that empower customers, including those who are vulnerable and disenfranchised, will help financial institutions to become more competitive. So for us, the future of product management is fundamentally about putting the customer at the heart of every decision that a financial services organisation makes. So by using technology like Core Labs, we hope that firms will become much more dynamic and responsive to changing customer needs and changing behaviours. Yes, so that we can develop and offer more products and services that work for customers, but also to more quickly identify those products that maybe aren't doing what they're intended to do. Financial services firms are there to do one thing and that thing is to empower people and sometimes we forget it because we got very complex tasks, heavy regulations, a huge burden of demonstrating how we make decisions and if we can just find the peace of mind and the time and the tools and the information that are required to reconnect with the mission then we can do an immense good for society. Digital technology not only grows the economy, but it's also an important part of how we make everyday payments. MasterCard is working closely with fintech companies to ensure that previously excluded and underrepresented individuals can use payments technology and tools to help manage their money better. My mum was a kind and lovely, generous lady. She would take money out of the cash point two or three times a day and give that cash away. She would visit shops multiple times a day and buy the same product multiple times a day because uh, she'd forgotten she'd purchased it. And she definitely fell victim to fraud over the phone a lot. Jane Sibley's mum, June, lived with dementia for seven years before her death. It reached a point where the family had no choice but to take away June's access to her money in order to protect her finances. When you take away someone's financial independence, you take away their independence. So there is no longer the trip to the corner shop to buy the paper in the milk and chat to your neighbours on the way. 
It led to Jane and her husband creating the first debit card for people living with dementia. In partnership with MasterCard and the Alzheimer's Society, Sipstar enables the person living with dementia to have a debit card and the caregiver an app where they can set how and where that money is used. Research shows being independent and socially active can slow down dementia. Just because you have dementia doesn't mean to say you can't choose your grandkids' Christmas presents or buy your sister a coffee at the coffee shop. You know, what we spend our money on is, is um, makes us who we are. What we're able to do with a, with a company like Sibstar comes to us with an idea is to be able to connect that idea, how they connect their consumers, into our network. So all of a sudden, that payment card can access all the merchants that accept payments across the UK, whether it's in person, a corner shop, or being able to shop online. So we can help them take an idea and turn it into reality quickly. So Juliet, we're going to use eye tracking technology. MasterCard is continually developing innovations to include more people across financial services. It works with traditional banks and fintechs. The Financial Conduct Authority estimates over a million people do not have access to banking in the UK. There's something called the poverty premium, and that's the amount that people pay extra because they don't have access to digital payments. So, for example, if they're feeding the meter in the wall rather than being able to pay their electricity bill online, and that can amount to £430 a year extra that people who aren't digitally included end up paying. Algebra is another fintech partner. It's an online bank that's ESG and Sharia compliant. Nizam says its purpose is to open up the financial sector to women, people from Muslim, Black African and Black Caribbean communities. MasterCard were a no-brainer for us. They are fully aligned with our vision. Their global vision to bank over a billion people around the world. But locally, they are really committed to making sure different community groups have access to fair finance. At the moment, a million people are unbanked. 13 million people aren't financially resilient. If we were able to to bring all those people fully into the financial ecosystem, that could be worth £7 billion a year to the UK economy. Inclusion should help both the economy and people. For Jane, Sibstar is for the nearly 1 million people living with dementia in the UK. Her experience with her mum will help them to live a better life for longer. And this is an amazing legacy in memory of your mum. Yeah. When I got the first Superstar card, I went to see her and I showed her. What's wrong again? Yeah, that was good, wasn't it? And I think she looked pleased. Yeah, I think she understood on some level and, and you know, that's, that's enough. The subscription economy is growing at a rapid rate, but consumers are increasingly looking for more flexibility and transparency. Miller Technologies partners with top-tier banks, fintechs and subscription businesses, helping them to drive engagement and improve the experience of over 50 million subscribers. Subscriptions. They permeate every aspect of our lives, from how we consume entertainment to simply paying for basic necessities. With billions signed up for recurring payments around the world, the process needs to be both seamless and flexible. One of the companies at the forefront of the subscription revolution is Miller Technologies. We sell software to retail banks and merchants. Essentially, we help consumer manage subscription like Spotify, Disney, Netflix in their banking application. So we're connecting consumer like you and I with subscription businesses which are growing inside the banking channels. The need for such a platform is growing exponentially, with a subscription economy already worth $650 billion and forecast to grow to $1.5 trillion by 2025. We are giving control. Right, and everyone loves to have control, right? So nobody likes things to be confusing. Nobody likes ambiguity. So what we are doing is forget everything. Just work through your banking app. Most of your spend is there. All your money is there. Manage it from there. Pay for things you need. Pay for things as long as you need it. And when you don't, just get out of it. When you again do it, just get on with it. Empowering billions to get on with it requires the kind of groundbreaking software you'd expect. 
Aptitude and Minna Technologies are working together. So what we do is, is to give tons of flexibility to consumers around the ways that they manage their subscriptions. Aptitude Software is the brand behind eSuite, which is a powerful subscriptions, billing and revenue management platform. Minna are very much embedded in the banking side of things, so that then translates to the Aptitude or the eSuite stack because we're, we're corresponding between the two. We're completely proliferated with so many digital subscriptions now that managing all of those is becoming a real headache for consumers. So the joy of the, the combination of, of Minna and Aptitude is that it gives not only our clients in terms of the, the kind of the vendors of these subscriptions tons of flexibility on the way that they engage with their consumers, but it also gives consumers a lot of flexibility as well. Minna Technologies is at the forefront of the new era of flexibility in the subscription economy and its partnerships in the banking sector in particular offer a huge range of benefits to consumers. We spoke to over 2,000 consumers in the UK and the United States and over hundreds of businesses. So if you look at 18 to 44 age group, one in two consumer will actually switch banking application if their bank did not provide subscription management. Overall, if you look at it, it's one in three. I think that says it all. In a growing subscription economy, Minna Technologies' innovative approach is allowing their clients to offer a wide range of services. It is really valuable partnership because utilizing the competence, the business model they have, we can provide more innovative solutions to our customers that is maybe not our core, but what is expected from our customers. Something we did innovatively together with Minna Technologies is that you can very smoothly take the saving money you have when you cancel the subscription and with two clicks utilize that to open a savings account where you get interest. And this is very easy and intuitive and very popular among our customers. And that popularity is the foundation for further innovation. Next for us is uh, expanding our coverage in terms of getting more subscription businesses and more banks to start offering this at scale. So driving that awareness that they don't have to be on the phone queue or write letters or emails trying to back and forth with the subscription businesses, they can actually engage from where they're paying, which is the banking channel. So driving that awareness and education. Most forecasts show that the pressure on consumers from the cost of living crisis will persist for some time. Zopa Bank, together with ClearScore, have developed the 2025 FinTech Pledge, a cross-industry coalition of partners with a goal to build up the financial resilience of UK consumers by 2025. The whole reason the fintech industry exists is that there was a gap in the market where the incumbents were not able to give simple and intuitive products for customers to be able to take control of their financial lives. As we saw what was happening in the cost of living crisis, we felt we could play a very active role in actually helping customers build that resilience. That has always been in our DNA, but the crisis was probably beyond what a single company could do. The idea for the 2025 FinTech pledge came from the desire of the CEOs of the digital bank Zopa and financial services marketplace ClearScore to help people build their financial knowledge in a difficult economic climate. It's a timely campaign because the Financial Conduct Authority recently found that as the cost of living increased, so did the number of adults in the UK with low financial resilience. That's why the Money Charity, which helps people improve financial well-being, is part of this initiative. More and more people are struggling to pay their bills, have missed payments, are not able to feed their children, are you know just in arrears on rent or mortgages. But I guess introducing the concept that you can control your money, that you can take action, that there are things you can do that can help improve your financial situation is also a really powerful message. Zopa Bank and ClearScore are funding more of the money charity's financial well-being workshops for adults. 
The aim of the workshops is to help people more directly, including vulnerable groups such as those who are homeless, refugees, care leavers or people who live with disabilities, and recognising that digital channels are a key source of information for many consumers, they've also created a TikTok campaign called Master My Money that has useful tips and practical advice on personal finances. Follow along and we dive into the facts of a quick pension quiz. The correct answer is at a specific age. This is usually between 65 to 67 in the UK. It also features on the Pledges online hub. These initiatives support the key focus of the pledge to help people help themselves. So we want consumers to actually take control of their money in four ways. The first is about saving, so getting a better savings rate for their money. The second is staying on top of their credit report and score. The third is saving money on their bills. And the fourth is consolidating their debts and making sure that they're paying as little interest as possible. And you can do really amazing things with all of these fintech uh, products. Switch your savings, get in control of your pensions, find extra money, control your credit score, get a new interest rate, refinance your debt. So these little actions can make a big difference. The coalition wants to drive 25 million consumer actions by 2025 to help people build their financial resilience. It's an ambitious goal because if one action is taken per person, that represents around half of the UK's adult population making a positive step. Launched in 2022, the pledge has now mobilised a cross-industry coalition of 50 fintech firms and their industry partners who joined forces to tackle the cost of living crisis. And so far, it's driven more than 10 million consumer actions. Today, we have more than a million customers. But if you look at the whole coalition, it has more than 20 million customers. So we're able to reach a far greater number of uh, consumers in the UK, which is incredibly important. What would be an aspiration for me is really how can we get some of these companies to come together and create unique products or customer journeys or customer offerings that actually are focused on the fintech pledge and help customers take some of these actions in a much more seamless way. We don't do financial education very well. And one of the things about often British families is we don't really talk about money. Money is a bit under the carpet, right? And so being able to get people to just understand the core concepts of interest and saving and how you actually uh, can sort out your finances is really important. So big plans for the future, which also includes growing the coalition's member base and driving new initiatives with them.